Hello, everyone. Thanks for joining us today. We have a, a great presentation titled Fiber Characterization, and this is in two parts. Today we're going to tar talk about part one, defining fiber characterization and its parts, and it's presented by myself, Larry Johnson of the Light Brigade, and Tim Yount of Fiber Insight. Uh, but before we start, we want to go over some housekeeping issues, and that's so um, you can expand the uh, this the slide area by clicking on the maximize icon on the top right of the slide area or by dragging the bottom right corner to enlarge. In fact, you can expand and reposition many of the components on your screen, so feel, feel, feel free to do so to arrange as you desire for your optimal webcast viewing experience. At the bottom of your audience console, there are multiple application widgets you can use. And if you have questions during the webcast, you can click on the Q&A widget and submit your questions. Uh, we're fortunate we have uh, Tammy with Lightwave here, and she can address many of the, the detailed questions as far as audio or presentation type. And at the same time, at the end of the session, uh, Tim and myself will uh, take on the questions and answer those as best we can. At the, at the close of the session, so until then, we'll just be uh, uh, gathering questions for you. We're also going to be talking together, sometimes uh, separately, um, so we're, it's going to be a unique presentation, I hope, for everyone. And uh, for any reason, if you experience any technical difficulties during the webcast, please click on the Help widget. It has a question mark icon and addresses common technical issues. If you this just type your issue into the Q&A widget, and a member of our webcast support team will work with you to correct the problem. Any additional resources for this webcast can be downloaded via the resource list widget that looks like a green folder at the bottom of your screen. And for your convenience, this presentation will be available immediately following the uh, live event. And we will also send a reminder email uh, message uh, from uh, from the Light Brigade, also talking about the next uh, session, which is part two, which we'll talk about later as well. So uh, let's go ahead and talk a little about each of the companies. Um, the Light Brigade is a fiber optic training company, and I don't think I have to, to read the bullets here. I think uh, you can read them just as easily as I can say them here. Uh, but we're, we're honored to present this uh, presentation, especially on such a unique topic. Matter of fact, it's so unique that we had to split it into two parts. So this is more the introductory primer portion versus the second more technical portion. And uh, the, uh, we're honored to have Tim Yount of Fiber Insight, uh, who also specializes in advanced training and certification. And uh, there's several different courses and certification programs that uh, are offered. And these are on screen as well. And um, we also offered the, the website. You'll also get both Tim and my email addresses at the uh, end of the course. So with that, let's progress into what is fiber characterization. And it is the process of qualifying and documenting a fiber link. And if we look at this as a point-to-point uh, -point network, we can see that there's uh, fusion splices, there's connections, there's uh, the transmission side at both ends of a system. Uh, there may be intermediate cross connects. Uh, distance can be relatively short in the case of a local area network, or it could be an extreme long haul example. It could also vary on the data rates, and these are very important because as your, your data rate increases, or the speed of your system is required, then we have to look at fiber characterization to maintain the, the signal level quality that's uh, required for the span. And we're really seeing the impact of high-speed systems. So as we're progressing from the, the legacy sonnet SDH type systems and then moving forward into the optical transport network and, and at higher speeds of 100 gigabits and up, uh, the, the, the critical need for fiber characterization is required. So to simplify, we're separating this into two categories, and that so... So the first part is basic testing, and that which consists of connector inspection and cleaning, insertion loss testing, optical return loss, which is different than reflectance, and we'll talk about that in 
in particular. Um, the role of the OTDR, which we've used historically to measure length of the fiber, uh, the attenuation of a fiber span, and then event losses for both uh, attenuation and reflectance. Tim, would you take so, uh yeah, so hi everybody, uh, Tim Young with Fiber Insight. Uh, it's really uh, an honor to, to be here to present to you today. Um, what I'll, let, me, uh, let me do a little bit of a, of a qualification on what is fiber characterization as well. As, as, Larry, sh as Larry just showed you, that you know, we, all, we all are, most of us are familiar with the basic testing portions, but the term fiber characterization actually uh, is a little bit of a debatable term depending on who you talk to, and, and the, the concept here is that um, what we're trying to help uh, people understand or, and the industry kind of uh, uh, grasp or, or to embrace is fiber characterization uh, depends upon what you're testing, and it depends on the type of link you're testing, as Larry showed you before, the enterprise and, and all of the, uh, the land-type applications, the shorter distance applications like fiber to the home, but also the longer haul stuff. So depending on what speed you're doing and everything else, uh, it depends on what kind of measurement. So as Larry mentioned, the basic testing here, which are these fundamentals that most people are familiar with, up through OTDR testing, we get into advanced testing when we, when we really talk about networks that are going to operate. Gen uh, generally, the general rule is 10 gigabits per second and higher is when you really need to be looking at, um, uh, at uh, testing. Uh, PMD and, and chromatic dispersion are the primary ones here. Um, it also depends somewhat on the distance that you're, you're measuring as well. So really short distance networks don't necessarily need to, uh, need to have those tests performed. Some companies actually require that even on their shorter networks because of, uh, of service level agreements and those kinds of things. Spectral attenuation I've got here kind of grayed out a little bit at the bottom. That's a, that's a measurement that is sort of a, a, a variant on insertion loss testing, but it's, it's actually uh, measuring uh, uh, measuring over the a range of wavelengths, let's say over the C band or whatever. So again, we're going to get into all these. Uh, we're going to get into these deeper on the advanced side in our next uh, part two in January. But today we're really going to focus, as Larry mentioned, on the basic testing stuff. So we're going to really focus on the stuff today on the left side. So um, if we talk a little bit about uh, the network challenges that people run into, uh, uh, one of the main issues we run into is when we're actually testing a network or after, or we're actually when we're splicing the network, but we're testing it, we deal with different core sizes, slightly different core sizes of fibers, and that creates some challenges for us, especially in the testing side. Um, so one example here would be uh, uh, they could the G652 fiber. Uh, has a different core size or mode field diameter, if you will. Uh, you, could, you could discuss either one of those in that context. Or uh, G655, which is more for long haul networks, uh, would, be, uh, uh, would be a fiber that has a little bit different core size than G652. But sometimes these are spliced together. So when you have these uh, core sizes spliced, spliced together, uh, it, it does create some issues with, uh, especially on the OTDR side, but also some of the others. So even the same fiber types can vary in core size. So um, G652 might vary a little bit in core size depending on uh, the age of the fiber, um, old legacy fibers spliced to newer fibers, or it could be different manufacturers. Um, if any of you are familiar with, core, uh, with fiber, inst uh, with fiber uh, manufacturing, there's different methods for actually uh, uh, creating the blank to draw the fiber or to, to build the fiber from. Uh, and some of these vary in core sizes slightly. Of, uh, and it could actually even be a slight variation in core size from run to run within the same manufacturer and the same fiber type. So what this can do is this can actually cause variances in the directional uh, loss uh, uh, that appears or that, that shows up when you measure insertion loss or whether you look at the losses of events or I'm sorry, if you look at the losses of, uh, yeah, even events on an OTDR. Um, so you can see this variation in loss, which, uh, which adds some challenges to, your, to, your, uh, to actually analyzing an OTDR trace, for instance. Um, so for that reason, we uh, recommend, and most standards recommend, that bidirectional loss, ORL, and OTDR measurements are recommended. 
Um, ORL being more a directional reflections, but bidirectional loss in OR, OTDR primarily uh, because of these uh, core mismatches. Uh, and that's why, why bidirectional uh, measurements are recommended. And here's an example, for instance, of, a, of an OTDR trace that has actually been shot from both directions. And I've actually, I call this a butterfly. We call this a butterfly trace, which means we're actually uh, taking both directional shots of the same fiber and we're overlaying them together so that we can analyze them as a group and make sure we see the same number of splices uh, and we can analyze each of those splices and, pro and not only look at, the, uh, at A to B loss and B to A loss, but we can actually average those together to determine the exact, uh, to, the, to determine the actual loss of that event bidirectionally. Yeah, I just wanted to add a comment on those tolerances. You know, it's quite a bit. A uh, G652 can be 8.6 microns up to about 9.3, and that. So there's quite a bit. So you can meet the criteria of the standard, the ITU standard, but the tolerances are real, and they're there. And as Tim highlighted, the age of the fiber is critical because the tolerances are much better today than they were 10 or 20 years ago. So when you're dealing with older fibers, uh, you're going to have higher losses due to these tolerances versus newer fibers. So let's uh, look at the uh, um, basic fiber network challenges. So um, while we are so used to doing OTDR testing and optical loss testing, um, you need to make sure that uh, that you are referencing the device correctly, the procedures are set up correctly, um, the 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 importance of cleanliness and, and, and damage connectors can't be overstated. We're going to talk more about that. So when we talk about a, a bad launch or so from an OTDR where we're closer to the noise floor, uh, you should be able to recognize that. Any OTDR operator should be able to recognize it. But first, before you plug anything into an OTDR, clean it. It's, it's absolutely, and if you're going to do a lot of terminations, do it from the end of the test jumper versus the OTDR port because it's the most critical connector you probably have in your system. And that, and uh, also that when you get test reports of the OTDR, that they're analyzed to look for high reflectance levels or, or high attenuation levels. Hey, Tim, do you want to take the second part here? Sure. Yeah, and another another important thing, and I, you know, Larry and I are both in, uh, are all in the training business here as part of what we do, but uh, one of the bigger challenges that we have, uh, that, that we have in the industry is uh, to make sure that the staff are properly trained uh, to, to actually implement uh, valid testing procedures. And, again, all the things at the top here that Larry just mentioned is, is very valid. And it's, for, it's the ability for that person or persons that are actually going to perform this test to actually effectively set up the, the, pro, the test properly, to make sure that the, the references are done properly. Uh, I run into a lot of situations where people haven't even referenced in a, in a long time, and they may not even be using the same test, uh, the same transmitter tester uh, for the test, and they haven't, up, uh, they haven't referenced. So, uh, I have a reference recently, so there's, it's important that people follow procedures, they set the, pro the uh, equipment up properly because uh, if they don't, they won't get valid results. It's, it's as simple as that. We'll talk about launch, launch cords and things a little bit later, but it's important that, these, uh, that, that uh, we have, first of all, it's important to have valid test methods and procedures within your company. If you're a contractor, if you're, if you're a service provider or a private network operator, uh, owner, um, you, you really need to know, you nearly need to have test methods established based on standards and procedures clear uh, because you're, you're also looking at consistency from technician to technician. And you want to make sure your training is, is you have good training uh, for your operation and your maintenance staff so that these guys, these folks know what they're supposed to do and are good at it. Um, training is great. Experience is even more so, but bad experience is, is uh, it, needs a, it needs a good training fundamentals to, uh, to get started right and get it done the right way. And also frequent retraining. You know, methods change. We have, uh, in OTDR world, we have new ways of uh, looking at OTDR traces now. It's a lot easier than it used to be 
not that we haven't eliminated traces, but we have now options where uh, you can look at schematic versions of it. But there's uh, the the, net, the industry is changing fast. Retraining uh, is also something that is needed as as uh, the as the as the technology changes and as the ability of the equipment changes and the techniques actually will uh, are also improving over time. So uh, I don't know, Larry, if you have anything to add to that. No, I think you're hitting it right on the bullet. So, um, I, I, some of you probably are, right now we're going to talk a little bit about connector inspection and cleaning, and some of you guys are probably rolling your eyes right now, because every time you go to a training class, it's one of the things we beat on people about, and there's a good reason for that, quite frankly. It's, it's, it's that, number one, it's the, lar it's the highest, uh, it's the source of the highest number of problems in a network. Eighty percent is the data that's thrown around, it's the, it's the hard data that's been measured, uh, in terms of tracking issues, they 80% uh, of your problems are usually tracked back to a connector issue, and it's ironically it's also the the part of the, the network that is mostly ignored in terms of proper procedures and pro following proper procedures. I still run into folks that you know they. Uh, Fewer are spitting on their connectors before they wipe them on their pants, but but um, that's not that's not a, 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 an approved cleaning technique. It's not one that I recommend at all. So uh, you you really want to proactively inspect and clean. Uh, but if it's but if you check it with a scope and it's clean, don't clean it. It's 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 clean. So you want to make and the other thing is you want to make sure you ch you check both sides. Uh, it's the easiest thing to do. It's the most important thing you can do in a network. It's fundamental, but yet it's the most ignored. Uh, and it's a frustrating thing uh, being in this uh, industry and, and still seeing this kind of, uh, this kind of lack of, uh, of following these procedures uh, uh, the way they should be. So we're looking at, we're looking at this connection. That's, uh, uh, this is, uh, these uh, these uh, images are provided uh, courtesy of, of Viavi. Uh, but I, this is a great example of looking at an LC connector from a side view. So we see the uh, one connector has been inserted into the barrel. Some, some of you call this an interconnect sleeve. It's an uh, alignment sleeve or barrel. You can see the, uh, the ceramic alignment sleeve in the middle there, the white. And the, the ferrule is slid into that, and it snaps into place on an LC. So as I bring this thing in from the other side, I'm going to snap these things together. The physical contact there is about two and a half pounds of pressure, but that translates to about 45,000 pounds per square inch. If I have debris in the middle, uh, that's going to cause an offset. It's not going to allow those to mate to mate uh, closely. It's probably also it could also cause d uh, damage to that to that uh, to that connection as well. And again, if the debris has any physical context to it, it can cause an offset. These will cause pro uh, uh, loss problems as well as reflectance issues or ORL problems. Um, again, if this connection fails, uh, you're, you're down. You're down completely, or you can be down completely, and there can be a lot of loss associated with this as well. And I wanted just to add a couple of comments on uh, regards to this. Sometimes uh, manufacturers, especially in high-speed systems and DWDM systems, take a lot of care to make sure that their connector port, when it leaves their facility, is, is properly cleaned. But at the same time, in their manuals, they're making recommendations on even sometimes specific products and techniques to use. And, and these should never be discounted because in the case of systems like uh, dense wavelength division multiplexing, you can have it where a cleaning material may pass most of the wavelengths and the connector looks great, but it will fail on certain lambdas and that. So um, do pay attention to the manufacturer's recommendations for cleaning as well and up for it. Um, so, um, so looking at the, uh, the, the basic tests that need to be performed, uh, connector inspection cleaning, critical. And then we do our attenuation test, which is the insertion loss testing. And the OTDR testing, and, and those three we're We've had a fair amount of experience with, but I see a huge amount of 
technicians who do not perform optical return loss testing or understand the importance of it. And it, and it can't be understated, the, the critical nature. So uh, we're going to continue on with more detail on each of these categories. I'm going to pass this back over to Tim now. So again, uh, just to carry on with inspection and cleaning, uh, it is a very critical test. This is a, a great uh, uh, a graphic that actually, uh, uh, on the left-hand side, you see an example of a, of a digital inspection view of a clean connector. That's the one titled with, with the number one. Then under that, under that you actually see what a, a dirty connection can look like, uh, what a contaminated connection can look like. You see all the debris on there. Uh, the, and what we've done is we captured this onto a an OTDR trace. Uh, so what you see here in the middle of the screen is the OTDR trace. Um, and just, just so in case you're not familiar with OTDR traces or how they work, the, the number one is aligned with that first event that's at about uh, 20, looks like 20 meters away from the, from the OTDR, which is at the far left side. It's, uh, it's where that green line begins. Um, so there you can see that we have a loss of about a quarter of a dB um, and we've just captured this on the left-hand side here, and a reflectance of, uh, of like minus 67, which is a very good reflectance. I'm not expecting you to remember what's good and what's bad right now, uh, but, uh, but just relatively, this is the kind of a connection, this is the kind of view on an OTDR you want to see. And so this just pictorializes uh, what a good connection would look like. You, got, uh, you measure a loss by looking at the uh, at, the, at the power level before that little reflection and after it. And the vertical change is actually the loss, uh, just a simplified version of that. Plus that peak where that little uh, bump is, the height of that bump relative height of that bump indicates the amount of reflection or the contribution to ORL uh, that you're going to find in that. Um, so the first two events have roughly the same performance. Uh, but the third event, look at that. So the big drop after, before and after the event shows a big drop, which is the loss, which is about 4.87 dB of loss if you look at that lower left-hand corner, dirty connection. And it's got a very poor uh, ORL or a high number, a high amount of reflected light. You do not, we'll talk about ORL in, a, ORL in a minute in more detail, but that's that's not a good thing either. So what this really boils down to is it, you, can, you can have with this dirty connector, you can have both loss issues and you can have reflection issues. Uh, from this single connected interface. And just to put this, this particular dirty connection in context, um, of any of you that aren't aware of it, 3 dB of a change in power, optical power, uh, an increase of 3 dB is 50% uh, is power loss in your network. So that means that in this case, through this one connection, I've lost ha over, well over half of my network power with a with a loss level of 4.87 dB, and that is very significant. So the the thing about these uh, connections and the importance of cleaning a connection. Remember, a connection is a connector pair. That means you want to make sure you co you clean the, the 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 connector on one on both sides. So if it's a bulkhead and you're at a fiber distribution frame, you want to make sure you not only clean the patch port you're plugging in, but you want to clean the bulkhead. It also means that if you're plugging into an OTDR or you're plugging into a, an optical spectrum analyzer or any device, a dispersion tester, there are optical interfaces on the plug part of the tester. You want to make sure that's clean as well. Um, that is very expensive if you, uh, if you don't clean your OTDR port or your optical port on whatever your tester is because it's not, it's not an inexpensive thing to have to send that back in for repair. And when you, when you start seeing your signal levels drop, sometimes that's the problem is you're actually not getting a good launch. As Larry mentioned earlier, uh, having a good launch means you, you've got more range and you can actually measure further. Uh, so this, this connection cleaning and inspection and cleaning applies to patch cords, bulkheads, and even the test interfaces on the testers themselves. Larry, you want to take yeah, this one? Thanks. Yeah, now changing over to the attenuation measurements is uh, or optical insertion loss. 
is this is the real requirement that we have is knowing how much signal loss we have from point A to point B. And normally these tests are performed between the fiber distribution frames, also known as patch panels. Um, and what's critical here is that you do have your light source and your power meter. Uh, there's more exotic versions that can test bidirectionally or multi-fibers simultaneously, but here we'll show just a simplistic view of it. Um, as we are just talking about with the test jumpers, and sometimes these are referred to as reference test jumpers, um, so we want higher quality jumpers. We want to make sure they're in good shape um, because the accuracy of your testing comes down to those jumpers and the cleanliness of those jumpers as well. So, um, so to take this one step fur further, we're always going to be uh, doing a reference of the uh, light source itself. I like you uh, putting the, making, well one, make sure that uh, both the test source and the um, power meter are set at the correct wavelength and the same wavelength. Uh, secondly is I always start with a power meter in the DBM mode because it's, it, to me it's like driving a car. I know what it sounds like. I know what it feels like. Well, you get used to your test equipment too. And if you're getting a faulty measurement right from the start, you're saying something's wrong here, whether it's a battery or a contaminated port or a bad jumper, you know it. So um, first thing we're going to do is get a measurement in DBM and in this case minus 5 dBm at 1550 nanometers so of course we want to make sure the light source is set at the same then we zero the meter and that once uh, we set uh, zero the meter now we're going to need a second jumper as well because if you can see the first jumper is connected from the, the light source to the patch panel and then at the far end we're going to need to have a second jumper from the fiber distribution frame to the power meter and in this case uh, because we zeroed the meter the reading that we're going to obtain is going to be strictly in, in decibels and that and we can see that the loss over this span is uh, 35.25 dB and um, assuming that we're at 15-15 nanometers this is quite a long uh, length or fiber span here so we want to make sure that we're testing accurately and that, um, the, and that takes us to the next portion which is on optical return loss which is Tim's section well, I, I do want to add one thing on the uh, on the one before on the optical <laughs> insertion loss. Um, there are three methods of, uh, of referencing. What we showed you there was the one ref one uh, reference uh, method, which is using one cord, and then, as Larry said, you have to add a second cord. Um, some test devices today, some uh, <coughs> test devices today combine loss ORL and o for instance loss ORL and OTDR bidirectionally in one test set. Uh, so what happens is is that what the most important thing here is that the that the transmitter uh, output on the tester once it's mated to that reference cord it is not disconnected once that disconnection is made from the test cord your reference is is invalid you've got to re-reference at that point so when the when we talk about bidirectional measurements and these are automatic bidirectional measurements with some of these newer equipment where you have a, a tester on one end and a tester on the other and you're doing uh, you're doing transmit and receive on both sides. Uh, that requires you to actually uh, use a two reference jumper method. Uh, there's also a third one, but we won't get into that. But the two reference method means I've got a patch cord attached to each of my devices, and I'm going to leave those patch cords attached, and I'm going to join them together with a with a barrel in the middle when I'm doing the reference. Then I just once I finish the reference, I separate that those those connections at the bar at the center barrel plug those into the fiber distribution frames, and then I'm testing. So I just wanted to clarify uh, that there's more than one, uh, one reference method and, and the importance of, of, uh, of keeping those plugged into the transmit side, primarily the transmit side is a critical one. Now, talking a little bit about insertion, uh, insertion loss, uh, you know, the amount of light that's reflected back is a problem. Uh, can be a problem. There is going to be light reflected back in your network. So when I transmit light out, anything I hit that reflects is going to send light back. Even even a glass has scattering. We talk about backscatter, but that's such a low level. It's really it's totally insignificant from a transmission standpoint. But when I hit a connector, or when I hit a re some kind of a reflection, uh, you know, nine times out of ten, or ninety nine percent of the time, it's a re it's a connector. I am not only concerned about how much light gets through that connector, 
or I want to make sure that most of the as much light as possible goes through that connector, but I'm also concerned that that connector doesn't reflect too much back toward me. This can cause noise, it can cause data errors, and in some high high uh, power applications like uh, RF uh, analog video, for instance, with uh, with the uh, with the MSO world, um, it, if it's a connector close to the transmitter, it can actually damage the transmitter. So uh, we are concerned about these. They're, the big reflections are not your friends for sure. Uh, and the higher the data rate, the more sensitive blink is to optical return loss. It's also more sensitive to loss, actually, to attenuation. But it's it's very it's much more sensitive to optical return loss. Uh, and I mentioned the high power ne networks before. Um, what ORL is, and there's a, there's also a a little bit of a confusion. We're going to be talking about reflectance in a few minutes, too, when we talk about OTDR. But optical return loss and reflectance are, are, are brothers and sisters, basically. ORL is the ratio of the total amount of light that's reflected to the amount of light that's transmitted. So it's the ratio between the light that comes back and the light that was sent. But it's looking, ORL looks at the total length, okay? It's one number. Okay, so you may be looking at a number that's better or that's uh, greater than 27 or 28 dB is a minimum number that you want to get, but that is a number that you're looking for. And if it's anything lower than that, uh, you're, it's a problem. And ORL is, is measured in positive dB values. So as a guideline here, a value of uh, greater than 27 dB passes. Uh, the lower numbers would fail, and the higher the higher the number, the better. So if you have something that that comes in around 33 dB, that's that's a good number uh, for ORL. But o, but reflectance, and we'll talk a little bit more about that, is the contribution of reflections from each of the reflective events. So if I fail ORL, I'm going to troubleshoot it with, uh, with, uh, with my reflectance values that I get from my OTDR, just to clarify that. So you can actually do ORL measurements using an ORL meter. Uh, sometimes it's built into the attenuation test set, and ORL is all integrated into one, so you're making both measurements on that device. Sometimes there's a separate ORL meter you're measuring it, and you can also make ORL measurements using an OTDR as well, although they're not quite as accurate as, uh, as a full ORL meter or, uh, or uh, a test, uh, an ORL dedicated test system. And again, yeah, don't okay. confuse ORL with optical reflectance. They're a little bit different. And, Sorry, Larry. You know, one Yes, definitely so. One thing, too, is uh, system manufacturers will put values on their equipment, and one of those values um, is optical return losses. So if you want to obtain a, a certain bid error rate, they're going to say, well, your attenuation has to be between these levels, your reflectance level between these levels. And then as we go further, in, especially into the next session, um, chromatic dispersion and PMD, um, there's reasons for these values, and, and therefore the importance during the testing that these are documented can't, it can't be uh, understated in that. Okay, and so also, uh, if, you, if, you hear, if you hear event ORL, the term event ORL, that actually means reflectance. It's the same thing. Sorry, Sorry Larry. Go ahead. Uh, that's okay. That, that's a good point. And that, so uh, the last of these, the OTDR testing, and, and in case there's anybody uh, new here, it's optical time domain reflectometry. But as you know, we, we like, love our acronyms in fiber optics, and that, so we tend to shorten this. But what we're looking at is a measurement of the span. But if we look at the top bar graph, in essence, we're seeing the OTDR linked up to a patch panel. Then we see the span under test with a, a host of uh, splices and then a far end patch panel and then a, a link to um, um, under test. Now, what we're really showing here, though, is, is uh, some fiber launch cables, or dead, sometimes known as dead zone boxes, um, that allow us to push out the first connection uh, so that we can make reflection and attenuation measurements through uh, that device. And, of course, your OTDR can subtract those measurements because that length of that um, dead zone box is not part of your span, so you need to make sure we subtract those out. But we do need to make accurate measurements from these. And then as we look at the display, we see four Fresnel reflections. These are abrupt uh, optical changes that occur between um, the different fiber types. Uh, if we had an air gap, it, we'd see some ghosting effects or echoes in essence. 
Um, and again, the uh, amplitude of those spikes t also tells us the reflectance. However, never use the left scale on the OTDR as a reference to the amplitude in true dB. Uh, we had to suppress the Fresnel reflections to make sure they fit on the, the screen. We also see some fiber sections uh, here. Uh, after the first patch panel, there's uh, one, and there's a second section, which says fiber section, and that's an attenuation in dB loss per kilometer span. It's a ratio measurement. Um, and then a series. Then, then we see one span in the middle, which uh, shows a gainer on the front side and a higher loss on the far side. Uh, this would be caused by an, an optical uh, tolerance or mismatch occurring in the fiber, and this is not abnormal, but it is one of the reasons why we want to measure bidirectionally so we can average that measurement out. Um, in the reality, we would never get a, a gain in a, between a transmitter and a receiver, but we'd definitely um, get the higher attenuation as far as the um, going from the larger to the smaller mode field diameter. So that's why we want to average that uh, out and bidirectionally. Um, and that so, and then at the far end, the, we can see where the patch panel is, and that's where the end of our span is. And again, we have a, a, a far end Fresnel reflection there, and again, we have a, a mated connection, so we have a much lower Fresnel reflection. Then we have a fiber span, and that now we have a glass to air connection, and you see an extreme uh, spike caused by the amplitude of, of that type change. Okay. So, uh, Tim, why don't you work on the uh, explaining the trace summary on this next? Well, well, you know, when you when you look at an OTDR trace on on an OTDR, uh, you generally will see the trace at the top half of the screen, and you'll generally see a uh, an event table at the bottom of the screen. This is just a a a, a, a screen capture that I grabbed for of an event uh, of an event table. And what an event table does, it basically summarizes. So the OTDR will automatically shoot that fiber. It gives you the trace that you just saw or something similar to that, and then it'll actually identify automatically. It'll, it'll uh, locate, identify each of the events, determine whether they are reflective or not reflective. You see the first, uh, the first column here is the event number, the number of the event from the, from the left side to the right side. Then it indicates whether or not it's reflective or non-reflective or, or whatever. And then the first three columns after that, the distance, the loss, and the reflectance, in this particular uh, vendor example, um, those are actually measurements made uh, in the case of, uh, of distance. It's distance from zero, so it's cumulative distance from, from the start of the OTDR trace. Uh, it could also be calibrated to be the start from the end of your launch cable. If you saw on that previous slide, you saw the, 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 on the left it was a launch cable, and on the right it was a receive cable. But if I've got OTDRs on both ends, they're both launch and receive cables, depending on which end you're working from. But that's an accumulative distance value that I, that I can use to determine the distance of that link. The loss values that you see in the next column are actually the loss, losses, of the, uh, the, the event losses at those events, regardless of whether they're a connector or a fusion splice or a bin, for that matter, uh, that's the loss of that particular event. And then the reflectance, if there, if it is a reflection, you'll see in the case of this, the reflective column, uh, and you look to the left and you see those reflective uh, icons, um, the reflective, that's reflectance in dB. And it, if you notice there, it's a, it's a negative number. Um, so it's really important if you're learning about OTDRs that you understand when you look at ORL, it's a positive number, and you want better than, than, uh, than say, uh, 27 or 28. If you're looking at reflectance, you're looking at negative numbers, and you're looking at values that are, say, less than 40 or less than 45, or if they're APC connectors, you want them less than 55 dB. Um, so those reflective values are very important to determine uh, what the performance of that connector is, the loss in, this, in that first that loss column, and then the reflectance in the next column. The last three columns in this particular example are actually sectional measurements. So the slope is the slope of each of those segments. I don't know if you remember the previous slide. We had that little those little brackets, and it said the slope of that one section was was 0.2 dB per kilometer. Let's say um, that would help me indicate that I'm measuring maybe at 15, 50 nanometers, and that that's the, the value that I should be getting of that slope. Um, also, sectional length is the next column. That is between each event. That's the length, that's the length between the events 
uh, that are identified on the OTDR. And the loss between events is the last column in this particular example. So there's a lot of good information here if you understand how to read these. Um, and again, with some of the more advanced uh, functionalities on the OTDRs, uh, this stuff is kind of laid out more for you fundamentally if you if you want to if you want to see it schematically displayed. But we didn't we don't really get into that uh, functionality here in this particular presentation. Larry, did you have something to add? Yeah, just to make sure that people understand when they're when they're seeing that event table and it says reflectance in DB, it is reflectance and it's not optical return loss. So. Um, you know, they're, they're two separate uh, issues, and optical return loss, is, as Tim mentioned, is the sum of the, the span and reflectances component. So if you want your ORL value, you've got to make sure that your OTDR is configured to show ORL uh, versus reflectance. Yeah, and so if I'm, if I'm, uh, if I'm uh, doing an acceptance test on a fiber run and I have an ORL failure on my measurement, uh, what I'm going to do then is after I'm finished with my measurements, I'm going to go into the OTDR trace that I've shot in that acceptance test, and that's going to help me define that if I can locate that number of that reflectance value that's that's a, 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 a low minus number, so it might be minus 27 or minus 30, uh, that's going to indicate to me where my problem is. So I can dispatch someone to go in and check that connection and actually go in and fix it. So the ORL and reflectance actually works together in that respect. So you've taken all these measurements, the, the fundamental measurements that we've talked about. Um, just as important is the ability to document them. Now, I'm a maintenance guy. I may not care about it. I may just be troubleshooting and figuring out what's going on and getting guys out there. But if I'm doing acceptance testing, I'm going to ultimately need to generate a report. I'm going to ultimately need to analyze the, 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 the results that I have. and, and and formalize it. So when you're doing the testing, you've got to make sure that you're saving and storing all your traces correctly and your naming conventions are critical. So how you name your files, how you organize them so they're easy to find in your in your file menus. So I'm going to be saving uh, all my results. Now, a connector inspection, some people want to, con uh, want to save them all. Some people only save connector inspection results that are failed. So it depends on your procedures. It depends on what you need to do. But, uh, but standardized procedures not only for testing, but also for storing the data. And here's examples on this slide of a, a connector inspection report or a, or a, a stored uh, information that's, that would go into report. The loss in ORL there in the middle of, uh, of the, you know, your, your average loss. You can look at loss A to B, loss B to A, and the average of that. Uh, whether you whether you document all three of those values or whether you just provide average uh, loss values in, in both directions, up to you. Depends on what your procedure is. Same thing goes with ORL. Or actually, ORL is a directional value, so ORL A to B and ORL B to A. But you would not average those together. So your doubt, your values are actually going to be uh, at each wavelength that you measure in loss and ORL. Uh, and those values would all would all be stored there. OTDR test results, you're going to be looking at splices, uh, the connectors at the ends, uh, and a lot of these have the pass fail automatically built into it. Um, sometimes uh, some people will just uh, literally take the stored information, document it, print it, and send it on. Uh, that's okay with loss and ORL data. Uh, for OTDR trace, however, that you see on the right-hand side, for OTDRs, it's a little trickier than that because the OTDR is only so good at consistently identifying correctly uh, each event, every event. Sometimes the events are so small the OTDR misses them. Sometimes there's a little bit of noise and the OTDR mistakes an event for noise. So post-processing, I recommend post-processing your OTDR traces using software uh, that's available from the vendors. Uh, whoever match your OTDR processing software with the vendor that you're using, but go in and actually look at those traces. There's there's methods to do that quickly. Uh, validate all that results. So in the end, you want the report to be concise. You want the report to be uh, an overview, but you really want to have a record of of what passed and failed, and what the overall health of that network is. So th these are examples of uh, of those types of, uh, of report elements that would go into that. And one thing, Tim, that you touched on was the ability to recall a trace. And the, 
overlay capability to look at a trace a year down the road or so and see if a, a waveform's changed in any way, it's, it's critical to do so. And to do so at, at two wavelengths or even if you're operating in 1310 and can use a WDM and, and test out of band at 15, 15 nanometers or uh, as the L.41 uh, ITU standard specifies using even 1625 and 1650 nanometers. Um, but the technicians should know how to do overlay comparisons, but uh, somebody needs to be able to take a look and say, is this still within specification or not? So very critical on that role. And that that leads us to the what we're going to really talk about in our next session, uh, which is the advanced fiber characterization. So this is just a brief overview. And what, uh, what we've seen is... Um, as our uh, systems evolve and as data rates continue to climb, is uh, systems operating at 10 gigabits and, and higher are really uh, limited by chromatic and polarization dispersion issues. And this has to deal with a couple different things. One, chromatic dispersion is a combination of material and waveguide dispersion, material being the spectral width of the this laser source and also the fiber, and the uh, waveguide dispersion, which is uh, due to the speed of light and the, the cladding of the fiber versus the core of the fiber because the mode field diameter uh, is about 20% uh, larger than just the pure core, and that's why we tend to use the term mode field diameter versus core in single mode fibers. Um, but it re requires the testing to be done to find out at what value uh, of dispersion is taking place, uh, whether it's a CD value or a PMD value, polarization mode dispersion, uh, with the description listed here. And this is real critical, but I, I had one scenario several years ago where um, to go in to evaluate whether the span was going to be tested. The first thing was, and many of you may recall the biconic connectors, where they had biconic connectors. And the problem with the biconic connector, it was a flat polish. So it would never pass the return, uh, the optical return loss because of the Fresnel reflections first. So until the, the reflection problem was resolved, we couldn't test for PMD and CD. And that, um, or we could have, but it wouldn't have passed there either way. So. So it ended up being a problem. So even though the, the, the standard cleanliness, the attenuation, the reflection testing, the role of optical attenuation measurements and OTDR can't be understated because of this. So um, we wanted to get this out of the way as a fundamental level first in that, and, and then we can address the, um, the more advanced topics in the... Uh, the next session. And we also want to introduce and make sure people understand the, the different ITU specified bands as the original, the enhancement, the short, the conventional, the long, and the ultra. And that, especially in the role of older fibers, and that and can affect the measurement. So, Tim, why don't you summarize the session and then we'll, we'll move on to Q&A. Sure. Okay. Uh, so, we talked about connector and in-face inspection, the, the importance of doing that, uh, and the importance of cleaning all the surfaces that are going to mate together. Um, and we talked about uh, the optical insertion loss. Uh, some people call it OIL, IL, or the total loss of the link in DB, a very important measurement, as well as optical return loss, or that total reflected impact of the link in DB, or the amount of light reflected as a ratio to the amount that was transmitted. We talked about the OTDR, the importance of the OTDR. I refer to the OTDR as my, as my uh, MacGyver tool, if you will. It does so many different things. Uh, it measures so many different things, and, and it actually is your, one of your key troubleshooting tools. Uh, but it provides you with a visual link assessment and sort of a fingerprint of your network. So it's a very, very important piece of equipment. But the key thing is that you want to make sure your tests are valid, and to do that, you need to know you need to know how the test is to be performed. You need to be consistent, properly set up, how to set up each of the test pieces of test gear, and how to document all those measurements. These are all very, very important. So as, as Larry mentioned, we're going to talk on, in, uh, in our next part two, January 18th, we're going to discuss the advanced part in more detail. We're going to jump into this in, in a lot more detail. Uh, and but we're, all, we're going to touch on the basic fiber test again. So remember, fiber characterization is is every, any test you can make on that network, depending on the complexity of the network, the length, and everything else. And, um, and we will talk more about why the advanced tests are needed, when they're required, why, and we're going to review each one in a lot more detail.
Okay, at this point I'm going to uh, ask, I'm going to review the questions and uh, ask them of Tim. Either of us can take them, but it's easier if I just ask and Tim can follow along. So, uh, Tim, one question is this, please define Fresnel reflection. So, a Fresnel reflection is actually just the, the reflection that happens uh, when you go from, uh, from a, a glass to air interface. So in other words, if I have, a, if I have two connectors and they're joined together, there's, a, there's still a very small uh, glass to air to glass interface, and that's going to cause that re reflection. So the, for, the Fresnel reflection is that, is that jump that you're going to see or the reflection that I see on that, where with a fusion splice you're melting the fibers together and you're just going to get a drop-in signal, as you saw in the OTDR, uh, you're not going to get a reflection of that light. Okay, we have another question here. If ORL is a, hello? Okay, um, excuse me, the question list. What is the meaning of tagging and labeling? And I'm not sure I understand this. I understand labeling, that, but uh, um, that it's well, critical. To well, I, I'm assuming that what they're talking about is labeling the ports labeling your fibers, because uh, uh, sometimes, and again, I, I'm assuming I understand the question, because that's, uh, that, that question probably could use some clarification, but what sometimes we do is we, we will test, uh, let's say we're doing a, a, a test and we're qualifying it for a certain speed, and this really comes into the advanced testing more so than the other, but if I'm testing, if I can qualify a, a, a link to say to be okay, this link will work at 10 gig, this link will work with 40 gig, and so on and so on. I may tag those fibers if I've tested them at certain levels, and I can test them at different levels and look at the different performances and actually tag them for different speed ratings. I don't know if that's what they're referring to or whether they might be talking about tagging ports to make sure that you've got, uh, that you've got correct continuity uh, and correct port alignment between, let's say, point A and point B on a link. So uh, if that if the person that asked that question wants any more clarification, feel free to, uh, you see on the screen our email addresses. You could, be, could email either Larry or myself and clarify your question a little bit more, and we'd be glad to chat with you more about it in person. Okay, question. What is the lowest possible per splice loss in DB, assuming best case conditions, new fiber, cleanliness, skilled technicians, et cetera? <laughs> well, that's that's an interesting question because that's an interesting question because it, it also ties to what the what the minimum acceptable splice loss is is dedicated. I'm working on a project right now where um, I'm not going to say who the customer who the end customer is, but they're requiring a maximum allowable splice loss of 0 0.05 dB bidirectionally averaged to be measured and clarified. So anything above 0.05 a DB on that link, on any of the links that, that are being tested, is a fail. And um, the, the standard is more like dot two, uh, or in some cases a little bit different. So um, dot one to dot one five to dot two, those are more reasonable numbers that you could set as a minimal. I mean, it's, it's, in terms of the lowest splice loss you could achieve, theoretically you could get down to almost zero. Um, the, the main thing here is this, splice, splicers, are not splice loss measuring devices. Remember that. So if you have a splicer and it says, if I'm making all my splices and, I'm, and my splices keep coming up at 0 .01, 0, uh, 0 .02, 0 .00, 0 .00, 0 .00, this is not the measuring device that you're going to use. You still have to go through and do an attenuation test on that because the, the splicer is, is using a calculation based on certain criteria that the splicer has in its, uh, in its uh, algorithm to estimate the, the loss of that splice. But uh, that is not, uh, if you use that as the, and you trust that as your source of information, uh, you're going to get yourself into a lot of trouble. I hope yeah. that helps to answer your question. Yeah, and Tim, I'll add on to that too. And you know, one thing is saying that um, you know older splices have older tolerances, and you may not be able to obtain a splice better than a certain value. So my rule of thumb is, if you splice it three times and it doesn't improve, you've got to take and you see a consistency between the between the three types. You take it because um, unfortunately, fiber tolerances are fiber tolerances, and just re-splicing to get a new value and hope it comes out better may not work. 
So uh, this is part of the problem we have with older systems. And so we're going to move on to the next your core, question. Your core, mismatch, your core mismatches can also create some issues there as well in terms of how low of a splice loss you can get. Okay. Um, sorry. Sorry. Yeah. Okay. So what about testing in-building riser loss to give specific head-in, tail-in losses for purposes of determining correct launch power into the outside plant? Why don't you take that one, Larry? You're more yeah, I, I think more uh, what we deal with here is that, you know, the, the problem is we've got a short span normally, and therefore we're dealing with the pulse width of the OTDR, and you're trying to find out, uh, you know, how much – Power one, how much power, but the other one is is uh, what the attenuation is through the the fiber plant. So you know whether we need a dead zone box, and if you need to get a power measurement, that means you're going to have to do an optical attenuation test of the dead zone box or the the fiber to find out what the loss is. If you're using OTDR, then you can subtract that uh, loss uh, from your power measurement to get that power measurement that you want. Uh, another another question here. Should the insertion loss test be done bi-directionally? Uh, yes. <laughs> uh, recommended, yes. It's not absolutely required. Uh, some people just choose to do it in one direction. Um, you know, I think if you, were, if you had installed brand new fiber and it was all exactly the same fiber, you might, you might be okay just testing in one direction, but or the, the standards recommend bi-directional testing, and that is the way to get the most accurate uh, results is to test bidirectionally, average the results, and use that information as your as your uh, values against your link loss budget. Okay, another question. What about cleaning connectors on equipment? Uh, this question is coming from a uh, manufacturer, so I'm taking it. It's the port connector that he's talking about. So. Uh, and uh, so he's saying often the fiber can't be accessed. Can the connector be cleaned? Well, again, if it's an optical interface, uh, you really need to get to it uh, some, if you can get to it. I mean, I've had situations in, in, uh, in government installations where I couldn't get to the back of the – I could get to the port on the bulkhead, but I couldn't get access to the back behind the bulkhead to actually remove it and clean it if it was really dirty and I couldn't get it off the other way. But – if there's a bulkhead, if there's any kind of a bulkhead and there's a connector on the back of that, you really need to get to to clean it if you can. Um, but if it's like an SFP, a lot of SFPs don't actually have optical uh, ferrules. They have a lens or some other type or they have some kind of a lens device or a detector in the back, and you can't actually uh, – there's no optical interface. So it's just light going free space into the back of that. You can't do anything about that. All you can do is make sure that you clean the patch patch cord or the connector that's plugged into it. Um, but you really need to take – you can still probe that SFP. I always re uh, recommend to people, look, probe the SFP, see what's in there. If there's a fiber ferrule in there, clean it or, or inspect and clean if you need to. If there's not, then don't worry. Really, you, there's not much you can do about it. Um, Okay, we're getting down to a few minutes, and um, in case we're not able to answer all the questions that have been sent in, there's quite a few, we will be responding electronically to each of these, but we do have time to take maybe one or two more. So um, the question is, is can you um, illustrate attenuation values taken with an OTDR compared to attenuation values with a optical loss test set? I think the I think the general number is that uh, that the OTDR uh, loss values are not as accurate as the uh, ultimate uh, values of, a, of an attenuation test set. I don't recall off the top of my head, but I think it's like uh, some some places I've seen it's plus or minus a couple dB. I don't, Larry. Are you familiar with what the standard actually says on the differences in accuracy between the OTDR and the attenuation test set? I generally you know, don't use I, the OTDR for attenuation values because I don't consider it to be accurate enough in a in a two point environment. I, I agree. the The attenuation test set, due to the calibration requirements of the power meter and a, and a stable source, is a, an actually calibrated measurement, and therefore it's a traceable measurement. Where the OTDR is a theoretical measurement, 
So uh, I would have to look into the standards to see what the standards say, but uh, the fact that one calibra requires calibration and one is theoretical, that tells me that it, I'm going to take the optical loss test uh, measurement any day over an OTDR measurement. Well, and by theoretical, uh, I think Larry means that it's a relative measurement. So what you're doing is you're looking at the signal backscatter level at one point in distance, location, and you're comparing it vertically with a scatter level at another at another location. So there's linearity issues, there's directional issues there. Um, it's it's a little more of an indirect measurement than you would be doing with a with an attenuation test set type measurement. And uh, one last question we can get today, and the rest we'll have to answer is, uh, what is the main cause of a gainer uh, in a link? Core mismatch. A core a core mismatch between the two fibers. It could be Again, fibers of different age, one core or mode field diameter is slightly larger than the other one. That's why you'll see a gain in one direction or, or a visual gain in one direction and a loss in the other. The loss will always be higher uh, uh, than the gain because there, there's going to be a, a net loss. If you add the two values together and divide by two, you're going to get the actual number. So, um, but again, uh, the mismatch in core is what, what causes that, uh, is what causes the, the apparent gainer. But there's no such thing as a gain. Uh, you know, without having an amplifier. So uh, it can't occur, so that's why the bidirectional measurements are so important. Okay. Um, for everybody, thank you for the, your questions. There's many we did not get to over the session. We will respond to you electronically. We do have your email address and that. And uh, so on behalf of uh, the Light Brigade and Fiber Insight, we'd like to thank Lightwave and the Pinwell Corporation. And uh, the presentation you will have access to uh, shortly. And we thank you for joining us today. And we really look forward to uh, having you attend the, the next session, part two, which is going to focus on chromatic dispersion testing and polarization mode dispersion testing. That session will be on January 18th. So we wish everybody happy holidays. Have a great new year. And uh, we'll hopefully uh, be in front of you again next month and next year. Thank you. Thank, thanks. Thanks, everybody.